The John Show Estate is clearly one of the most significant historic residences in the San Fernando Valley. The estate's remarkably intact Spanish colonial revival design, skilled craftsmanship, and expansive grounds are a true revelation, beautifully evoking the early history of the San Fernando Valley. This property was actually on a very large piece of land. It's debated whether it was 300 or 500 acres at the beginning. A gentleman named John Show purchased the property in roughly between 1918 and 1920. And he moved here from Nebraska with his wife. John Show was a scientist and had made a lot of money in Nebraska. And they moved to Windsor Square in downtown Los Angeles. His wife didn't want to leave Los Angeles, loved it so much. And so they decided to buy this property on the outskirts of Los Angeles. We're literally right at the western edge of the city. And they bought it really as sort of a wealthy man's hobby. They were wealthy and they didn't really need a ranch to raise fruit and all that for commerce, as much as just a sort of what a grand thing that a wealthy person did at that time. And then they waited about five, seven years until their citrus orchards and their walnut orchards became large enough to be harvested. Right at that point, they built this home. This is a 1938 aerial photograph of the John Show Ranch and surrounding area. This is Ventura Boulevard right here. The freeway wasn't in, obviously, at that point. This is Hidden Hills, and that's Calabasas before it was developed. Our home is right here, and then right behind it was a swimming pool and tennis court that they had. And then this was their ranch area. This is Walnut Acres in Woodland Hills. We think that may have been part of the ranch, but we're not sure. This rectangular area was sold to the Motion Picture Country Hospital people in 1939 or 1940 when John Show passed away to pay his estate taxes. So it's quite interesting to see how it all lays out. And this is actually Mulholland Boulevard right here coming through intersecting, which was part of the ranch. The original address was Mulholland at Ventura Boulevard. The home itself is about 5,200 square feet when it was built, about 6,000 now. There's an addition that was done in the 1950s. And the home is actually poured in place concrete. John Show was afraid of earthquakes. He was earthquake phobic, as his daughter told me. I interviewed his daughter when she was 89 and blind before she passed. And she said that her father, uh, being a scientist, was very conscious of earthquakes in Southern California. And he wanted to make sure that the home never came down. So he hired an architect by the name of L.G. Knipe. And L.G. Knipe was actually an interesting man. He had patents in concrete. He was a sculptor of his own right, as well as just being a designer of properties. He was involved in the design of the town in Arizona called Litchfield Park. He built many properties in Arizona that were quite historic. a famous bank building in Tempe and a building still standing at the University of Tempe as well that was a large commercial building. So he did a lot of commercial projects as well as a few homes for wealthy people. And he was told by John Cho to design this house to never come down and to be structurally impenetrable, basically. And so the home has poured in place concrete, steel reinforcing in that concrete, very, very interesting design, a lot of structural elements that incorporated some of the patents that he had in concrete at the time. So the house was built in 1928, right before the crash in 29. And at that point, of course, John Show was a wealthy man, had less income issues to worry about. And so the house was given a lot of detail and elements that really he didn't spare any expense on. And so in 1940, when John Show passed, the family then had the house passed on to the daughter to Virginia. And she lived in it herself with her children for several years and eventually kept selling off different parcels. And then it was sold to a group of 17 Mormon families who used this house as a Mormon church. And they built the addition that's right behind me, which we refer to as the Mormon room. And we've had several Mormon families here that were part of that church. And they laugh about us calling it the Mormon room. And they used this as a church while they raised money to eventually build the Mormon church that exists now on Mulholland. And when that church was built, they then subdivided the 12 acres down to 17 families, plus this house by itself separately, which they sold off. And it changed hands a couple times with just a few families. Then we acquired it in a probate sale. My husband really wanted to move to a larger house when we lived around the corner. Actually, I grew up in this neighborhood about three blocks away. She grew up about nine, 10 blocks away. We've lived in this neighborhood pretty much all our life, other than college. 
So I asked my husband, I said, well, what about that big house around the corner? And he said, what big house? I never knew this home was here. I would walk this neighborhood and never saw it because there are giant oak trees in the front and the home is recessed from the street. So you really can't see it very well from the street. So we walked up the driveway and nobody was home and the house was empty. And it started really the process to buy it because the daughter that had inherited the property didn't want to share the property or the funds from it with her brother and there was a dispute back and forth. And so she kept hiring realtors to show the property but wouldn't let the realtors let anybody in the house to see it. And so it took a long process. Eventually the brother took her to court and then it went to probate as a result to have the judge say, okay, sell it, split the proceeds between the two kids and we bought it in probate. It was an almost two year trek to get the home. The first day we moved in, we were dealing with trying to get a toilet working and just some basics for living life. We had no working kitchen at the time. It was a challenge. When we purchased the house in 2002, we tried to connect with every owner that had been in this home, and we actually uh, did from Virginia on up. When I interviewed Virginia, there were some interesting facts. My wife and I had been told that this had had some movie stars lived in it previously. We had been told that Betty Grable, a famous actress, and Harry James, a famous trumpet player, had lived in this home, which is not true. And the way I found out was when I interviewed Virginia, I said to her, I heard somebody famous lived in that house. And she said, no, I don't think so. Nobody famous has lived there. And I said, well, I heard a movie star live there. And she said, no, I, I don't think so. I've, I've known everybody that's lived there at any point in time. And I didn't want to give her the name, but finally I just said, I heard Betty Grable lived in that house. And she got very upset, got kind of pissed off. And she said, Betty Grable never lived in my house. I, she's never lived there. And I thought that was an interesting reaction. And I said, you know, why such a strong reaction? She said, Betty Grable lived nearby. She lived on what would be the other side of Calabash Street School. Betty Grable apparently and Virginia had a water dispute. Betty Grable and Harry James cut off the water coming into the ranch. And so she sued Betty Grable. But after a couple months, her attorney convinced her that she would never win a lawsuit against Betty Grable, so it was dropped. There were also three movies filmed on the property, not on this acreage that we're on, but behind us on the actual John Show Ranch. One was the movie Dragon Seat, that Katherine Hepburn movie, a long shot of the Asian village in that. And also the prison camp for the movie Stalag 17 was where the modern day Mormon church is located right now. And if you look in the background at some long shots of that prison camp in the movie, you'll see trees in a straight line going up a hill. Those are actually trees that are on Mulholland. The third movie that was filmed was The Bamboo Prison. And when you watch the home movies of the show family walking through the Stalag 17 movie set, in subsequent home movies, you see them walking through the exact same sets, but those sets have now been turned into an Asian-themed prison. You see grass on the roofs. So the exact same set was repurposed for this third movie. When they subdivided this house away from the rest of the other acreage and they subdivided 17 plots, for, one for each Mormon family, they custom built homes back there. And that hill behind us is now called Mormon Hill. And all of those homes have features that are very common in terms of food storage for Mormons. They've got large pantries and you know big attics you can walk up in with all sorts of storage. But also the lot behind us was empty the whole time. And that's because that was originally set aside by the Mormons to be where the community pool would be. It was never built and it was actually attached to the house behind us. But when that house and property lot went up for sale, we bought the lot and the house together, subdivided the land a little bit differently, sold off the house and kept that lot so someone could build a garage here because when we took over the property, there was no garage. And now there's that opportunity on that lot for someone to build a proper structure there. One of the families that lived here was the Dempsey family, and they did significant things to the home. First off, they added the driveway in the front of the home. Mr. Dempsey was a pool contractor. Originally, you crossed the creek over a bridge and you parked where the pool is now. That actually was the driveway, and you walked up the steps to the home. Mrs. Dempsey walked through the home with my wife. She looked in the fireplace in the living room and she said, oh my gosh, you still have those end irons. And my wife said, what, what are you talking about? She said, well, those end irons, my kids put those there. And my wife said, really? She said, where did they get them? And Mrs. Dempsey said, the kids got them from the Layana Adobe. 
which is now a state park next to Calabasas, they went over there in that old abandoned adobe that was in distress and they took the end irons out of the, the house and they brought them into this house. So for 60, 70 years, the Lianas adobe historic end irons have been sitting in our house. So we kind of felt embarrassed that our house had those brought over here. So we contacted the historian for the Lianas adobe, Los Angeles State Park System. And they had someone who was apparently a smith and had done a lot of metal work. And so the historic person was able to come over and verify, yes, those likely did come from that property. They matched everything else that was being done there. And so we gave them back to the Lianas Adobe. So if you go over to Lianas Adobe and you visit it and you see the end irons, just know they were sidetracked here for 60 years. The Dempseys had several children that were in sports, including one that grew up to be the most valuable player in one of the World Series games, Rick Dempsey. When Mrs. Dempsey walked through, she noticed a small stained glass window to the right of the front door. At that time, we hadn't repaired it, and it was a very badly done repair on the stained glass. And she said, my son was throwing a ball against the cement house and missed at one point and it went through the window. So my wife debated with me about that. She didn't want to repair it. Major League Baseball guy had broken the window with a baseball and it was a story, but we decided in the end to put it back historically the way it was. The other thing that Mrs. Dempsey pointed out was in the Mormon room, as we call it, the bar that was there at the time, she walked in there and she said, that bar is still here, it's been 40 years or more. We said, well, why is that significant? She said, well, my husband, a contractor, built that bar in one day for a party that we had and I can't believe it's still here. <laughs> so it did eventually come down and we put a brand new bar in there, but we thought that was kind of fun. Now we didn't file for any historic designation. We did that deliberately. We wanted to be able to restore the home and not have to go through the bureaucracy of having approvals by a government agency on what we did. We didn't remodel the home, it was restored. So what my wife and I did was when we moved into the property, we first had to get some working toilets because there were some challenges there and other plumbing issues because the home had really been in disrepair. But then we hired a historic architect. The Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation were the guidelines that we used to define what the project scope would mean and to preserve and protect the original historic parts of the building the same time removing the later non-contributing parts that were detracting from the elements of the house that we think is important. And we hired a preservation restoration company that had done Hearst properties and other famous properties. And they spent seven years. In that seven year period, there were only 26 weeks that there weren't people working on the home. So it was a long process. We touched just about every aspect of the home. We rewired the home. Every light fixture was rewired. All the wood doors were painted. The front door had been painted. The fireplace had been painted. We took off all those layers of paint and we brought them back to what they were historically and restained them back to what they were originally when the house was built in 1928. And our historic architect actually went down and scraped the walls, found the original layers of paint. And so several of the rooms, the living room I'm in now, the dining room, the library, other areas of the home. Those are the original colors that the house was painted when it was constructed. Our tile committee was impressed at the abundance of Malibu tile and how it was incorporated into the home's design. The hallway is one of the most dramatic home entries we've seen. So one of the very cool features of the house is that it has original Malibu tile. When we first moved in, we knew nothing of tiles. And so we kind of explored and took photos and tried to find out what we had. We talked with the historical architect we were working with as well that gave us some leads. And so my husband and I made a trip out to the Malibu Lagoon and the Adamson House, which we found out was owned by the people that owned Malibu tiles. We walked in and we started noticing some of our tiles. I think we've got that one and we've, we've got that one and that one. And a lady came over and talked to us and said, oh, you know, we've got a tile committee that comes out to verify homes that have Malibu tiles in them. Where do you live? And we said, oh, we're Woodland Hills in the San Fernando Valley, you know, just over Topanga from the beach. And she said, you know, there's no Malibu tiles in the valley. They're mainly Pasadena, the west side. And so we just kind of let it go at that because we knew we had Malibu tiles. 
So several years later, we were working on things and I thought, you know, let me just take some photos and send it to him. And as soon as I did that, we heard immediately like the tile committee wants to come to your house. We had the Malibu Tile Committee come out here, verified everything, give us a certification in writing, as well as they held a later event on their own here, since this is the only home in the San Fernando Valley with original Malibu tile. The flooring in the main hallway is Gladding McBean. Most of the other tiles in the house are from Malibu and one of the middle bedrooms that we use as an office. They had not seen that tile anywhere before. So she went through all of their tile books and found that was a tile. And that was the first, I think, known tile that they had found of that particular type. So that's an unusual tile. It almost looks like it's a 1960s flower power kind of a tile. One of the great features about the bathrooms is really the Malibu tile. The floors in all of the bathrooms are original Malibu tile from 1928. And what's really fascinating, and actually the people from the Malibu tile committee that came out were quite intrigued by this and love this. If you look at the fixtures in the bathrooms, they're Malibu tiles. So for example, if you look at the towel racks, they are ceramic towel racks. And if you look at the toothpaste holder, the soap dish, Malibu tile. If you look at the toilet paper dispensers, the original ones we left in the wall so you could see them, those were sheet toilet paper dispensers that were Malibu tile. So the Malibu tile here is extensive. It's not just a few decorative items. They really used it for utility purposes beyond just the, the decorative pieces. What's really cool is they chose a significant amount of Malibu tile to put into the home. Now the tiles outside, when we redid our pool and the patio and the front steps, we wanted to get the style of the home included. So my husband and I had many, what we called violent agreements. <laughs> A lot of discussions and fights on which way things go and which way they don't. We were an advantage and that it took a long time, so we had a lot of time to discuss things. The Spanish tile outside is from Ardo tile, which is a tile that's sealed so you don't have to mess with it. We did also find a tile company in Topanga Canyon uh, where a gentleman had bought a whole truckload of Malibu tiles and he was recreating the Malibu tile look. So we worked with him to pick the tiles for the fire pit surround and the stair risers outside. And we designed the trip hazard strips that are on each of the steps going down. This house has a lot of green and I wanted green in it. Outside the gate, there's one set of tiles that's in a little square. And the reason for that is that's the end of the original patio where the stairs come up and we just kind of want to designate that as like, this is on top of the original stairway. One of the things that we spent a couple of years doing was the restoration of the patio on the west side of the property and, and the pool itself. And when we moved in, the patio had been built over what was really fill from the, the lot behind us had been pushed. And so it was needing to be rebuilt. We hired a structural contractor, they put multiple pylons in that hill to reinforce this house, even though they told me it wasn't needed, I put them in anyway, but also to really build up that patio to be what it is. And all of the rebar in the pilings, as well as all the rebar in that terraced area there, all of it has been made with epoxy coated rebar and 5,000 PSI. It should last a long time. And the wooden fence that's along the pool is a, a Brazilian mahogany, it's a hardwood. Although it's wood, it's fire resistant because it's very dense. So we've got this wooded creek next to us and we wanted to have a dense wood there that wouldn't light very quickly if there were a fire or something like that. So it's almost like a fire breaking away on that side of the property. The grounds have seen a transformation over the years, mainly through a lot of water and hard work. When we first moved in, everything was dead. It had not been watered in a long time. The only thing that was really alive were the trees and ivy, which you basically can't kill. We've planted over 250 rose bushes, a lot of agave that was here, and other plants. So we went from basically a brown, dead place to a place that's really lush and, and the gardens are a joy. There are a lot of trees on the property. They've been here many years. Many oaks, valley oaks, coastal oaks, 
and also three trees that we know are original because we can see them in the old photos. In addition, I had the idea that since this was a citrus farm at one point, that we should plant lots of citrus. There were some already in the front yard. We've added to it. There were a lot of dead spaces when we moved in. So if there was a dead space, I stuck in a tree. We redid the fence on one part of the property down near the compost piles, and we added citrus. In addition, there was one apple tree that has been here many years, and we got lots of apples out of it. The tree finally died, and I've planted two more apple trees. One of the very cool features of this home is actually the substantial amount of stained glass on both floors. And the living room has these beautiful arched windows that are just spectacular. The entryway has beautiful stained glass as well. And the kitchen and the second floor have features as well. We hired a company in Pasadena that does a lot of historic properties in Pasadena to remove much of the stained glass and re-let it in essence and put it back into place into the home. Some of the stained glass had been broken, cracked. There were a couple of areas that were obvious patches, but with the wrong kind of stained glass. There was stained glass that was missing, we knew from my husband talking with Virginia Show Snow. Researched it a bit, and I was able to find the stained glass. They were all made in Kokomo, Indiana, and they had been doing that for hundreds of years. So. I went back to Kokomo and selected sheets of appropriate stained glass that we could use for the patches and repairs. And actually they allowed her to go through the factory and look at every piece that was there and hand pick the pieces that matched what we needed. And she bought a lot of extra. So there's a huge crate in the basement of extra pieces as well. Not only has it been restored back to its original beauty in terms of the pieces that had to be restored, but also one feature that Virginia Show had told me about was the dining room table above it had had this very beautiful stained glass fixture, a rectangle. She described it as the size of a hood of a car. And you can see when you look at that ceiling, the squared area where that would have resided. And she said it was stained glass. So we have that extra stained glass now in the basement for someone to come along. We, we never got to it, but somebody could design stained glass light fixture above the dining room table that would match the rest of the features of the home. And in the dining room, the original piece of stained glass was replaced in the 50s, early 60s with a cut crystal. So it's still 70 years old versus 100. In the corners of the dining room, there had obviously been some sort of stained glass. When we moved in, it was just this white, opaque glass, which we knew was not original. In the front hallway, there's a chandelier. So I figured those corners probably matched the chandelier in the front hall. So what we did was we took that glass and we had our brother-in-law who did stained glass at the time make us the corners in what we believe was the original color of the stained glass. One other thing to know about Virginia Show when she, when she sold this house to the 17 Mormon families, there was a dispute during escrow. And apparently it, uh, it appears that Virginia had mentioned it to her priest that she was selling the house because the Mormons wanted to build, build a Mormon church. And the priest reacted by saying, well, you know, you should sell it to us because we can build a Catholic church. And so she tried to back out of the transaction and it was a dispute that went on and the Mormons wouldn't give up and legally they didn't have to. And so Virginia was a little upset when she left. So she took a couple things with her. She took two stained glass fixtures in the entryway and that big stained glass piece that was over the dining room table. And when I visited her, she was living in Newport Beach on Balboa Island in a very nice home. And those two stained glass windows that were taken from the entryway were in her home. She had mounted one kind of casually on a door that led to the garage because she had nowhere else to put it and another one somewhere else. And they were spectacular. One was a conquistador with a metal helmet and a sword and bright colors. And the other one was a Spanish sailing ship with big sails on water. Very, very spectacular, very pretty. One other thing that Virginia told me was that the entryway originally had big game heads on it. I guess her uncle was a big game hunter. And so her father had mounted these heads on the wall all the way around there. So it must have been an interesting sight walking into this home and seeing all that. One of the great features of the home is actually this fireplace right here, which has features of citrus on it. 
When we moved into the home, that was completely painted with like five or six coats of white paint. And you could see that it was citrus just because of, they were round. But we wondered, was it painted originally? What did it look like originally? My wife and I had several uh, discussions about uh, how to take care of that. And she was going in there with things and scraping down to look at it. And I was trying to stop her because I didn't want anything defaced. And so we went back and forth actually for about three years on that. And then when we got to that point with our historic architect and the restoration company, they actually brought in four people that had done restoration on pieces at the Getty. And they sat on the fireplace hearth, which is Malibu tile, by the way, for three weeks, they used dental tools and heat guns to peel off the layers of the paint that got put on. And they got down to the original paint. And then after that was all done and removed, they brought in a professional faux painter that painted the citrus back to the way it was. But there are two pieces of citrus and a couple of leaves that we left as they uncovered it and we never faux painted it. Our historic architect insisted that we do that so people could see what it was originally in its original form. You could see they're a little dirty from soot through a hundred years of smoke coming out of the fireplace. As we've gone through the restoration process, we found some interesting things. We know that the fireplace in the library was changed by one of the families that lived here and the original rocks were yellow as can be noted on a back rubble wall fence where a piece of the old fireplace is there. Uh, and then when we were putting in a new fence in the back there, digging down, the workers found some art tiles with leaf imprints in them. Some were orange, some were brown. So we figured the original room was green, that deep, beautiful green, but with yellow rocks and orange and brown tiles showing nature. When we were constructing the kitchen, we found what the original footprint was when we took up off all of the flooring. We found that where the kitchen table is, it was the original dining for the family and it had a beautiful oak floor like the dining room and the rest of the house. The kitchen itself, it was a pine floor which had linoleum on it. And in the back, it was concrete where the service porch was. We've turned all that into linoleum for today's use since they're all connected. We saw where the old refrigerator was, uh, actually probably an ice box, where the stove was and the cabinetry was a little different. It had been changed in the 40s or 50s. So when we moved in, we lived with the kitchen that was there, put some appliances in. Then in 2010, we redid the kitchen, but there is one entire bank of original cabinetry that's still there with earthquake knobs, huge breadboard for making bread, a couple of drawers that had 10 linings that were used for sugar and flour storage because things were different in the 1920s. Some of the wood features and other features of the home are things we really enjoy a lot. The front door, I was told by a carpenter that was restoring it, is Honduran mahogany. When we moved in the house, the front door was painted black, many layers of paint. And so we had these old time carpenters and painters take this thing off the hinge for three weeks every day. They took it off, they would sand it, they would stain it, they would bleach it, they would sand it, they would stain it, they would bleach it. Every day they rehung it over and over again until they got down the wood as they wanted it to be prepared. And then they wanted to know what color to stain the door. And we really didn't know what the original color was. We couldn't tell by how it had been sanded. And so we thought about it a while. And then the carpenter pointed out, there's a speakeasy in the door. And when you open the door, they did paint the speakeasy. But if you open it all the way, the back end little tiny piece had never been painted. And so the original stain was there. So it's now been put back to the original stain when the house was constructed. And that is the same matching stain that's on the mahogany rail going up the staircase. A lot of the wood is redwood in this home. The doors are fur, kind of door panels that are pretty common. But it's hard to find panels nowadays that are one solid piece of plywood as a panel. And when you look at these doors and you look at the sort of tiger pattern that's on those doors, they're quite spectacular and really they're rather pretty. One of the more challenging aspects of the rehabilitation of the Almador house was what you see in the background is dark brown wood. Those are cantilevered projecting balconies, sleeping porches, and they were 
amazingly deteriorated by a combination of the sun and the problem of the cantilever itself. The sleeping porches had to be both braced and shored so they could then be reconstructed, including the cantilever through the residence floor itself. David Charlebaugh, who was the historical contractor, sourced old growth timber for what were known as heavy timber construction to replace the rotted and deteriorated and failing elements that needed to be repaired. On the other hand, the white part of the Almador house is all reinforced concrete construction. That almost had no need for any repair or restoration of its kind. When we moved in, there were no curtains in the home. So we quickly had to put up curtains in the front to have a little privacy. We bought some restoration hardware curtains and we hired a, a guy with a drill basically to just quickly put up the curtains. He was here all day. He kept breaking drill bits. He kept going to Home Depot and buying more concrete drill bits. Just to put up three sets of curtains, it took him eight hours. The next day we got a call from his boss and his boss said, what happened there yesterday? He had to go out with a disability in, on his right hand. And we were kind of shocked. We said, well, the house is concrete and the man that built it had a patent in concrete. So I guess he had some pretty strong concrete. So now the curtains have been put up by a very reputable company. They do basically the curtains to the movie stars. I'm not allowed to say their name or houses they've done, but they custom made the curtains and all the window coverings for the house. Another fun find was when we were redoing the walls up in the master bedroom, it became obvious from a patch that had been there that there had been an inserted bookshelf into the wall across from the fireplace. So they had originally had a little bookshelf, probably a chair facing the fireplace. We've also found some funny things around the house. Old children's toys from looked like the 30s or 40s, steering wheel from a little car. You're always finding kind of fun things uh, here and there. When we moved in, actually in the living room, there were different light fixtures up and we knew that they didn't look original. We found other fixtures in the basement that obviously had been removed in different parts of the house and just stored in the basement. We didn't know if those light fixtures belonged in the living room, but we wanted to, to find out. We contacted Virginia Show's grandchildren who actually had a family photo of a family member standing in front of the fireplace with a light fixture behind them. And it was the light fixtures that were in the basement. So we brought those back up, we got them restored. We also had places where light fixtures had been taken. So we actually had a person cast and duplicate a couple of light fixtures as well. And nobody can tell which is the original and which is the duplication. So they all match now. It's all perfectly as the house was originally constructed. In addition, there were light fixtures all over the house that had been painted. You know, when they painted a wall, they just did the light fixture. So all of those had to be sent out and get totally restored back to their original glory as well. Some of them are quite interesting. Up in one bedroom, one has this very profound and interesting character of a monk face. My favorite light fixture is one hanging in the hallway downstairs that I just think is just a cool little fixture. The other light fixtures hanging above the hall, above the staircase in the halls up there, are actually modern ones that we put in. There were light fixtures that were put in there. We think Virginia may have taken those light fixtures when she left and had that dispute with the Mormons. There were fixtures in there that really weren't quite right, and so we found something that had the Moorish look and replace those. And then we replace them outside as well. So we've made those all match and have a better look and feel for the home. Outside on, on the property too, along the pool and, and the patio, we also had some custom light poles made. Those have these green kind of domes coming down that have kind of a historic look to them when the home was built. Since the house has all these wood floors and tiled floors, we needed area rugs. We had shopped many places. And so we actually flew a designer with us to Istanbul. This was all prearranged with many conversations weeks in advance with a particular company. We bought the carpets of the home at that time and we had a carpet custom made for this living room. And this carpet was a design that had been done in a, a palace in Europe. So they duplicated that design. We did the color slightly differently and the main color, that brown, matched our gold retriever's coat. And so we did that so that the fur wouldn't show as much as well. This custom made carpet is quite large. 
It's silk and wool woven on silk. It took nine months, it's handmade. Every knot is hand tied. Incredible piece of art, kind of a museum piece that will stay with the home. The restoration was quite interesting, pulling in experts from everywhere. We had a lot of areas that really need to be restored back to their original essence. The handles on the windows had to be redone. They were very caked on and dirty. It turned out they were bronze. The wood floors were redone. The wood doors, many of the wood features that you see, whether it be the ceiling in this room and other places too, the, they were all restored fully and back to their original elements. Every hinge and every door got touched and restored. Some of the hardware on the kitchen cabinets had to be re-nickled. There were knobs missing in some places we had to find replacements for and match. And we ended up going to several places in Pasadena and downtown LA where people had deconstructed other homes of the similar era. And you'd go into these shops with boxes and boxes of knobs and things and go through to find something that matched exactly and then have our historic people put them into place. So a lot of time has been spent in capital to get it back to the shape that it's in today, which is really a beautiful estate. What makes this house so important is that we have a Spanish colonial revival style building with reinforced concrete walls, projecting balconies, and it's the last rancheria style building built in San Fernando Valley to fit around the groves of fruit trees. We've lived in this house for 22 years and it's been a joy, but we've put a lot of work and love and effort into this home to get it where it is today. We've had a lot of fun events here, including Christmas, a reunion, fundraisers, ladies' teas on the porch, ladies' teas inside for Christmas. My son's wedding was held out on the front lawn, and it was gorgeous, and we had the reception there as well. We've had a couple memorial services here. We actually even had a showing of Rockwell paintings for a Boy Scout fundraiser here. So we've had a lot of events. It's a really great family home fits a lot of people. So the house is grand, but yet it's homey and it's really worked well for our family. I don't know if you remember this, but when the house was in escrow, we didn't even own it at that point. And you came here with me on the property and we jumped the fence of the neighbor's yard. And we took a look at the side of the fence and looked up at the house. And I remember you brought with you a notepad and pencil, and you sat there and you sketched the house. I was kind of amazed, you you drew it all. It was kind of cool. What was your thought at that time? I remember jumping the fence, <laughs> for sure. And I tend to draw things at the beginning point. Uh, that's just the artistic part of architecture. We didn't get arrested, that's a good thing. No, we did not get arrested, <laughs> but uh, it was sort of like unveiling the primary facade facing to the south. Yes. I, I one time I had a uh, uh, a television uh, crew here that was doing a night shot for a pilot, and they stood on what was the old driveway overhang over there that was was before we had uh, taken it out, and they had this Emmy Award winning cinematographer went all around the house trying to find the best location for that shot. He said the best thing was on top of that element right there. Right. Uh, right beyond the pool, looking back this way at the house. And I, he said, that's the best shot of the house. I said, well, that makes sense because when it was built, John Cho had a bridge that he went through, came down, and that was how you approached the house. And you parked where the, the pool is now, and then you walked up. So that, that literally was the, the- That was the approach. That was the approach of the house, yeah. Yep. So you and I, when we hopped the fence, we were looking at the exact same uh, location, really. Yeah, that's Dry Canyon Creek. Yeah. Yeah. And that had that stone bridge. Exactly. Yeah, it was kind of fun. Yes. It was a good memory. <laughs> it is.